Okay. Well, thanks, Ben, for getting us set up here. Hello, everybody. I'm Valerie Roshan. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the president and chief collaborator for the Chamber Collaborative of Greater Portsmouth. And also on this uh, chat is uh, two of our staff, Ben Van Camp and Jen Stevens, who are supporting uh, this meeting. We had almost 70 people sign up today, and I know we don't have everybody on board yet, but uh, we're going to get started because I'm I'm uh, sensitive to our guests' time and your time as well. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, ben is our moderator. He's driving this meeting, this Zoom meeting, and he will keep you on a mute. So please use the chat function to ask questions. And at any time during any of our speakers' uh, updates, if you just send Ben a chat, he'll uh, queue up your questions for it. And um, if we, you know, we know that some Zoom meetings are getting hijacked. If we get hijacked, uh, Ben will just immediately close the meeting. And my apologies that it will be swift and, uh, and we'll lose our folks, but um, we'll need to do that. Uh, I need to acknowledge that we do have some folks from the city on the line here with us. We have councillors uh, Cliff Lazenby and Petra Huda. We have city manager Karen Kennard. We have our star economic development manager, Nancy Carmer, and the woman that we hear from every single day with the city manager's daily advisory, Stephanie Secord. Thanks for all the good work that all of you are doing for us during this time. I want to remind you that we have resources uh, and information that you need at portsmouthcollaborative.org forward slash COVID-19. You can see the end of my uh, whiteboard over there where it has that information on it, but there you can get information for all of the resources that you need. Uh, you should also be following our social, the Chamber Collaborative of Greater Portsmouth on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, the Facebook group Seacoast Strong Business Forum, and of course the City of Portsmouth Daily City Manager Advisory. Uh, thanks to Ben and Jen again for being the wind beneath our wings for all of the communication that you see coming at you. Uh, no matter where it's coming from, they are bringing it in and uh, we're bringing it in and they're bringing it back out to you. So I want to give you a quick chamber update. While Jen has been focused on bringing you the news from near and far, Ben has been focused on pivoting the chamber to online programming. Earlier this week, we had Ann Brown of Daystar hosting a webinar, a webinar to tell us how to work remote like a pro. Earlier today, Lee Gemeroth Consulting and Creative shared tips for marketing in these challenging times during our Power Biz Hour sponsored by TD Bank. Next Tuesday, the Power Biz Hour will feature a videographer, Dan Freund, presenting video solutions for today's touch-free world. And next Thursday, we'll bring you our very first Zoom, Business After Hours, hosted by Bangor Savings Bank and presented by our sponsor, Bank of New Hampshire. Make sure you join us for that. Visit the events calendar on PortsmouthCollaborative.org to learn more. We've also been working steadily to find support for our small businesses who've been hit hardest by COVID. I've been working with Congressman Pappas and Senator Shaheen's office to advocate for another round of funding for the PPP and EIDL loan programs and for allowing 501c6s, trade organizations like the Chamber, to be eligible for those funds. And while we know that all the funds in the current funding package have already been obligated, there is some concern from our banks that the backlog log of applications that they received but, not, but did not get funded is so deep that they may consume much of the funding available in the next phase. Uh, that's of concern, obviously. We're working on other options. At the state level, we're looking at small business funding loans funded through organizations like the Community Development Finance Authority, the CDFA. In collaboration with Senators Martha Fuller-Clark and Tom Sherman, our regional economic development authorities, the New Hampshire Travel Council and the New Hampshire Association of Chamber of Commerce execs were advocating for small businesses to access loans as part of the $1.25 billion that the state will receive next week as part of the, the CARES Act. At the state and federal level, we continue to push for insurance companies to cover business closure expenses that are not now covered because of the virus exclusion. Ch please check with the SBA, the SBDC, and all the resources that we have listed on our website to explore all of your options, and we will continue to post whatever that we find up there. 
Public health remains our main concern. We continue to push for fast turnaround testing kits for all of our businesses at no cost to our businesses so we can feel secure that our current staff, our returning staff, our customers and our clients feel safe to come back into our businesses. I wanna give a shout out to city manager uh, Kennard and to Nancy Carmer. If any of you have driven up and down Market Street, all of the trees and indigenous plantings are going in and I love these trees. They are so amazing and they are brightening up our gateway. So please take a stroll down Market Street or drive down Market Street and take a look at the good work that our city is doing to make our gateway so beautiful. Uh, a quick note from the city today, you're gonna to see this, um, which is some great news is that uh, Redgate Kane will be suspending its lawsuit while the city council and Redgate Kane re-engage in earnest in good faith negotiations to attempt to move the, pro the McIntyre project forward. Yay, thank you for all of those that have contributed to that. I'm here today with Portsmouth Fire Chief Todd Germain, Dr. Mark Punt, President and Chief Medical Officer for Convenient MD Urgent Care. If I got your the pronunciation of your name wrong, uh, doctor, I'm very sorry, and I know you'll correct it when you speak. Uh, Dean Carucci is the Chief Executive Officer of Portsmouth Regional Hospital, and he's also here with us. Each of us, each of them will update you on what's, what they've been doing behind the scenes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A that Ben will moderate at the end. Please make sure you enter your questions as they come pop into your head on the chat function, and, and ben, will, ben will put them in the, in the queue. First up is Portsmouth Fire Chief Todd Germain, who has been in the fire service for 28 years, 26 with Portsmouth Fire. He's been a, a paramedic for 20 years. In May of 2019, Chief Germain was promoted to captain from interim chief, uh, from captain to interim chief with the retirement of Chief Achilles and promoted to chief on July 1st, 2019. He also serves as, as the city emergency management coordinator under the direction of the city manager. Thank you so much. I know you're very busy, Chief, so thank you for being here with us today. Oh, it's great being here. Thanks for the invite. Um, I'm just gonna sort of run through uh, where, where we're at and how we got here as far as the fire department and the city's response to um, the, the COVID-19 situation. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the fire chief, also the emergency management coordinator and responsible for uh, activating the city's emergency management plans and uh, our plans, usually to respond to um, weather events and, and the things that um, would affect the city's operations or the infrastructure of the city. And that's usually what our plans are geared to. And we're very good at that. And we train at that all the time. Uh, we don't really train for pandemic responses a whole lot because, you know, once every hundred years, why would we train for it, right? Um, so this is a little bit different for us and because it, it's not an infrastructure situation or, or uh, city operations as much as it is. It's, I mean, it is, but also, it affects people in, in all aspects of life. So um, it's, it's been a challenge for us, but I think we're rising up to it pretty well. Um, as far as the fire department, what we've done uh, early on, we just watching the news, we knew that this, this pandemic was headed our way. So uh, we made sure that all our employees had their N95 masks uh, ready to go. And we thought at the time that it's probably all we're going to need. So. We, uh, we usually get these things fit and do that, um, but we purchased our own kit um, to be able to do that ourselves. So um, we started doing that back in early March. And we once we got ours tested, we went to the police department to make sure all their masks were fit tested so they were ready to go. So that's the beginning of what we did. Uh, and then from there, um, we, we adjusted our response and uh, just operationally speaking and, and some of those things included uh, adjusting our shift schedule so that we reduce the amount of times that employees are coming and going from home to work um, we've we practice the same distancing that you would in public at least the best we can which is tough for us because we never work in teams of less than two and, and it's usually many more than that so um, we're doing the best we can with distancing and isolation uh, we've adapted our training so that it's uh, just it's a we have three stations in Portsmouth, so we don't congrat we don't bring all the stations together anymore. We train individually at each station, so we've adapted that a little bit. We restrict station to station movement to what's just operationally necessary. 
Um, we do temperature and health screenings when everyone, when you come to sh work on shift, even myself every day, I do a, a screening and a temperature check and it's done every 12 hours that they're here to make sure that um, something didn't happen to you while you're at work or become symptomatic because if you are, we're gonna send you home. Um, we've minimized our non-emergent contacts with, uh, with the public, uh, mainly through inspections. Uh, our inspection division is, is we're keeping up with the inspections that are necessary if a contractor needs an inspection done to move on to the next phase of a, of a project. We're, we're doing our best to get that done and we're finding a way to get it done. Uh, but routine place of assembly and that sort of stuff we've put on hold for now. Uh, burn permits, we've, we're not issuing burn permits. Um, if you have a backyard permit that uh, you use for your, your, your uh, chimney or whatever outside, expired in December, I've extended that to June, so you don't have to worry about renewing that right now. Um, and we're just, we're responding to calls differently. You know, um, we've, we've always adapted in the fire service to do, you know, to, to new information. You know, we don't fight fires like we did 20 years ago because the way we did it then, we were getting cancer. So we changed the way we do it. It's like medical aid calls now. Uh, we don't do medical aid calls like we did three months ago because if we did, then we'd be susceptible to contracting the virus. So um, you'll see our guys, if they're on the street now, they're wearing masks and eye protection at a minimum, and, and then they ramp up their protection from there based on the call. Um, even routine calls uh, on with the fire trucks, uh, carbon monoxide investigations or car accidents, you'll see anybody, anytime anyone leaves the building here, they have at minimum a mask and eye protection on. and uh, and all of these things are being done so that we can stay healthy and to, if we have any problems, they're compartmentalized and see it's a one group at one station. The worst thing that can happen for us is we have one person become symptomatic and infects an entire shift of 14 people and I lose a quarter of my department at one time. So um, all of these measures are being taken to, to reduce that. Uh, probability and also to protect the public. We don't, the last thing we want to do also is to transfer, you know, an infection from one house to the next by going from one patient to the other. So all of these things are done with that in mind. And the police department uh, with Chief Murner and his command staff have, we've been in lockstep from the beginning as far as our preparation and response. And, you know, they respond in similar fashion as we do as public safety. So uh, they've taken all the same measures as well. And uh, we've been working closely with them to make sure that that they're as safe as they can be out there as well as far as their equipment's concerned. Uh, as far as the city overall city response, um, we first met on March 13th um, under the direction of uh, Manager Conard and uh, all the department heads have met at the time. It was every day, seven days a week. We're down now to a couple times a week now that we meet. Um, all the department heads uh, meet in a phone conversation and uh, we pretty much just tackle the problems that come up day to day. Um, and uh, it's essentially, we have an emergency operations center that we would activate for like if there was a weather event or a uh, disaster event going on. But since we all can't get in the same room anyway, we're actually doing a really good job of being a virtual emergency operations center. And we're all connected by phone and email and text. And, and uh, I can tell you that the, the emails and texts start at six in the morning and sometimes don't end until 10 at night. Um, but I, I can tell you is our department heads, you know, we don't often work, we, we sometimes work together to solve a, a common problem between a couple departments, but since you know mid-May, we're meeting every day and as a group and we've become a really cohesive unit and we're, we're all working together to solve problems that wouldn't normally fall under our purview in, in our specific department. Um, as, as an example, uh, Peter Rice and his crew at the Department of Public Works, uh, we, we were faced with a problem that our, our homeless population had no place to take showers now because the place they were showering, uh, the place they would do that are closed. So uh, came up with a plan uh, with, with the help of Ellen Tully at, at, at the welfare department and Peter and they got together and they rented showers and they found volunteers to run it and place to put it. Um, Steve Butzel at the library, uh, they have 3D printers. They've been printing out straps uh, to help ease the, uh, to make more comfortable wearing of uh, surgical masks for our hospital nurses and nursing home nurses. Um, Bryn Sullivan at, at Senior Services, she's doing in the middle of now a mask drive so that our uh, housing authority population and in, in, the, in the apartment buildings, they're more protected, they're wearing, so they can get the mask to wear so that they feel more protected and help control the spread there. And they're, you know, they're a vulnerable population that we're really concerned about. 
And, uh, you know, even, even Rusty Wilson in the recreation department and the Easter Bunny trail was his idea. You know, we just gave him a vehicle to drive the bunny around in, but, you know, the logistics of that were his and that was a lot of fun. And just an example of how all the departments are coming together and, you know, we're all coming together under uh, the leadership of our city management team with, you know, Karen Connard and Nancy Culper Puff. And, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to report that no problem has come forth yet that we couldn't handle as a group. And uh, it feels good to be able to do that. Um, I'm in a, as far as other stuff that the city response and on my end, I'm in constant contact every day with, uh, with a hospital with Malachi Fisher. He's the director of EMS and, and emergency management there. I get a feeling from him every day. I get the census of the hospital. And to me, that's the best measure of how the community is responding to the, to the pandemic is, is how full the hospital is. So um, I use that as my barometer to see how things are going here. And, and I'm sure Mr. Crucci is going to report that uh, things are pretty good there. Um, three times a week, I'm in on a conference call with the State Emergency Operations Center led by uh, emergency, uh, Homeland Security Emergency Management and uh, uh, Commissioner of Safety. We get constant updates and procedure recommendations as to how to, what, what to do best to handle um, response to the pandemic. Uh, weekly conference call with the governor um, through the mayor and the, and the city manager's office. We, we uh, get updates mostly on economic and social impacts of the pandemic. And, uh, and I'm also in a constant daily conversation, if not more than once a day with area fire chiefs and emergency management directors, just to make sure that we know what's happening regionally and that we're responding, you know, as quickly as we can if something starts to happen. You know? um, as far as the current situation now in Portsmouth, I think we're, we're doing pretty well. I mean, we're seeing cases like we knew we would. Uh, the cases are, are cumulatively increasing like we knew they would, but what I would consider a manageable rate, and I think we're managing it pretty well. Um, and it's a direct result, in my opinion, of, of, of our preparations and plans. Uh, the school department and, and uh, Steve Zadrovic closing the schools as early as he did, I think was a good call. Um, and just following the governor's directives of, of uh, staying at home and, and social distancing and limiting gatherings and so on, I think we're seeing the fruits of all that labor at this point. Um, I think we're far from exceeding the level of what our healthcare facilities can can manage, which you know that's the ultimate goal in in a pandemic response is to reduce the impact on that. Um, our you know our cumulative numbers are going to continue to grow, but again, I think you know at any given rate, any given time in the week, as far as our infection rates, it's it's more manageable at this point. Um, to that point, though, I think we we can't become complacent with uh, with the governor's orders and the social distancing and the gathering. We need to be vigilant. We need to keep taking it seriously. And, uh, and as far as reentry, I think, uh, I think the governor's office and I think the state EOC and, and commissioner of safety will have a good plan for us to start reentering uh, when that time comes. But you know, it's also important to not jump the gun on that as well and, make, and, uh, and do it in, in a way that we don't have a rebound of infection. I mean, can you imagine how devastating it would be here in Portsmouth if you know we ease things up and then there was a rebound in the, in the months of July, August, and September? We have to shut down. I mean, it would just be it would it would be devastating for us. Um, I guess to start wrapping things up for me, I want everybody to know that the fire department, police department, uh, we're here for you still fully staffed, we're healthy, we're 24 seven, we're doing exactly the same thing that we've been doing all along. We're responding to any emergency that you call us for. And uh, we're, you know, we're ready to go. And um, it's, it's been that way all since the beginning of this, of the pandemic response. And uh, we've prepared and, you know, as much as we prepare for that, we're also still training and preparing for our day-to-day -day operations. We just got our boat back on the water and we're gonna start training on that. Actually, they're out training on that, I think this afternoon. So uh, it's business as usual as far as our other emergencies are concerned for us. Um, also, I, I want to take this time to put a huge thank you out to the community. Their response to uh, to our, I guess, to our efforts has been phenomenal as far as we, we had a protective equipment drive, a PPE drive a few weeks ago when, when it was tough to get PPE and I know the, the public responded just phenomenally. We had a whole room full of stuff now and we have received monetary donations to buy PPE and it's just it's just been fantastic it's unusual for us you know to get help from the city because we feel that that's our role is to be there for them when they need something and uh, it's just been great the response from them and I, I want to make sure that the thank you goes out to them for sure um, 
and lastly, it's, you know, it's, it's going to take a community effort to get through this. And uh, it's clear to me that our community is rising to the challenge and, and we will get through this. Uh, I'm a, uh, I'm a baseball guy and I miss baseball terribly right now. And uh, I'm an umpire for the local little league. I miss doing that. And uh, in, in my opinion, this is, we're like in an extra innings baseball game right now. We're tied. Um, there's no clock in baseball. So you don't know when it's going to end. And all you can do is keep rolling your defense out there and making plays and making outs and, and, and living for another inning until it's over. So um, that's how I'm looking at it. And uh, that's my report. That's that's good. Talk about ending on a high note, Chief. Thank you so much for that. And I, I, uh, I, I am not currently a baseball uh, fanatic, although I, I have spent some time at games uh, with the Red Sox in the past. And the, uh, that's a great visual, actually, for me. So thank you so much. And thank you for updating us on the PPE. That's an important thing to, to add. Uh, I'm going to introduce next Dr. Mark Hunt, who's the chief the President and Chief Medical Officer for Convenient MD Urgent Care. Uh, Dr. Punt is a graduate of the State University of New York, Buffalo School of Medicine. He leads a team of expert physicians, regional medical directors, and medical professionals who deliver the highest quality urgent care that is both affordable and accessible. <coughs> Excuse me. Prior to joining Convenient MD, Dr. Punt, am I saying that right? Yeah, it's actually punt, but you're saying it correct um, in the German way. <laughs> I, I have hung around a fair amount in Germany, so I guess that's where that comes from. Um, yes. I'll go with the English version. <laughs> Prior to joining Convenient MD, Dr. Punt created MASH Urgent Care, one of the most prominent urgent care centers in New York State. He was also chief resident in emergency medicine at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Cleveland, and a top physician at Millard Fillmore Suburban Hospital in the emergency department. Consistent with the values of con convenient MD, Dr. Punt believes in local healthcare systems and helps to promote medical communities and leading experts, enhancing the quality, affordability, and availability of patient care. Thank you so much for making the time to be with us today. You're welcome and thank you for having me. I want to start with um, what we do every day for our community and let everyone know that what we do every day is still available. So we have 11 sites across New Hampshire, 11 convenient MD clinics and three in the Seacoast area. They are open 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week um, and we are still open for service. What we've done at our initial pivot when the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic occurred was to ensure that we had two venues of care at our sites. One, a clean venue inside the clinic. And to do that, we had to pivot to take care of those with potential COVID-19 infection, those with symptoms of shortness of breath, cough, fever, to take care of them in our parking lots and their vehicles. This way, we can ensure that we can care for both those who may be infected and for those who do not have any signs of any infection. And actually what we do is if someone would come to our clinic in the foyer, uh, what we do is take your temperature and determine if you have a fever and ask if you have any symptoms of cough, shortness of breath. If so, we would direct you back out to your car where our staff using appropriate personal prote protective equipment would evaluate you, test you if indicated for COVID-19 or treat and test you for whatever other uh, potential um, ailment or condition you had. If you did not have a fever or cough or shortness of breath, we would then put a mask on you to protect you and our staff still further and bring you back and have you go through the same uh, registration and care, triage and care uh, that we would give prior to this pandemic. So I want everyone to know that we're still there for things that are unrelated to COVID-19 pandemic as well. And so it, you know, those, those concerns of a, a colds, flus, GI upset, rashes, uh, lacerations, those types of things. Please still realize we are there for you eight to eight, seven days a week. When we look at what, what we've done and how we've pivoted to continue to um, help the community um, during this pandemic, first of all, our mission is to be there during the pandemic, before and after, to do what we can to ensure that there's an appropriate set of care um, for patients who have urgent medical needs, episodic medical needs that they don't anticipate, 
but don't necessarily need to be seen in an emergency department or hospital. That continues through the pandemic. So what we've done is we've pivoted some of our team to do a few other things to serve our community members during that time. The first is we've started a virtual urgent care service so that if one goes on our website, they can see the number to call and that number is 1-833-263-0131. Our website is www.convenientmd.com. And if you call that number, one of our medical registrars will greet you, get your demographic information, and connect you up with one of Convenient MD's providers for a visual telemedicine visit. That visit can be used to determine if indeed you're, you meet indication for testing at one of our sites, and we can direct you to the closest sites for testing, um, or if it is a non-COVID-19 related illness, uh, we can assess that on telemedicine as well. If you should need further testing or if a procedure is needed, such as a repair of a laceration, we can then direct you to the closest clinic for that as well. So we have had great success with our telemedicine virtual service, um, meeting many of the community members' needs. We've also um, opened up tent testing. One of those tents is in our ports, uh, in the Pease area of our port next, uh, across the street actually from our corporate office um, in the Pease area of Portsmouth, uh, where we can actually do testing for COVID. What we do with that is we first have you call our tel telemedicine service because we need to determine, is there an indication for testing? If so, we schedule you for an appointment at the tent. When you have your appointment, you drive up to the tent, they check your identification to ensure um, that you're the person that we have approved for testing, and you drive through while in your car, get tested, and you drive away. That whole experience at the tent takes about five minutes, so it is very efficient for the patient. Of course, our team, it has uh, personal protective equipment through this whole process. We then send that test to the lab, and when the lab test returns, we follow up with the patient uh, de depending on if it is positive or negative with appropriate advice and care. We do also have two other uh, the testing tents, one actually in Portland, Maine, um, and both the Portland, Maine and the Portsmouth tent are sponsored by Anthem, and we supply the staffing and the supplies for both PPE and testing. We also uh, partner with uh, Harvard Pilgrim in Quincy, Mass to do a similar tent. The other uh, way we have recently pivoted to, can, to find ways where we can help our community members as much as possible is to partner with the DHHS of New Hampshire and the governor's office, as well as the COVID Policy Alliance, uh, which, uh, whose chief medical officer is uh, State Senator Tom Sherman, to be able to go out and do testing um, of the staff members of long-term care facilities, to, trying to determine if any of their staff members um, should be pre-symptomatic, meaning they're infected but not showing symptoms, so that we can isolate them and prevent them from spreading the disease to the residents or other staff members of the nursing facilities or long-term care facilities. Um, we are actually working through Rockingham County and Hillsborough County over the next three weeks and uh, started that operation today and have already done over 1,200 uh, tests. So uh, we are working hard to work uh, to reduce the risk to that, uh, those, that population of uh, residents in those uh, long-term care facilities who are at the greatest risk of a bad outcome should they become infected. We um, just as another note on our telemedicine, uh, we are also able to take care, as I said, of non COVID related uh, complaints, um, such as the colds, the flus, the pink eyes, sore throats, sinus infections, and some GI upset. So it is not only for COVID related, but also for non COVID related complaints. I, I echo uh, the fire chief's. Um, Note that the, it is amazing to me, the community effort to do what's right, um, to, to adhere to the stay at home orders, uh, when they do, must go out at, in the community for groceries or food, wearing masks and, and appropriate social distancing. And as we know, currently that's the only real way we have to fight this pandemic. 
Hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll have vaccines and potentially other medicines, but none of those are currently available to us today. So as we all know, you know, in life, life is a circle of happiness, sadness, and hard times, as well as good times. And if you're going through a hard time, which we all are now together as a community, have faith because the good times are on the way. Thank you. What a great message. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Punt. Um, have faith because the good times are on the way. So thank you so much for that. Uh, very uplifting and very informative, very informative. Um, I do have some questions, but I think I've, uh, I've shared them with Ben. So when we get to the Q&A, uh, we'll ask those. Sure. I want to introduce next uh, Dean Carucci, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Portsmouth Regional Hospital. Dean has been with the Hospital Corporation of America since 2001 and was appointed CEO of HCA's Portsmouth Regional Hospital in 2015. He started his career at the HCA corporate headquarters in Nashville, Tennessee. And since then he has worked as the controller of CJW Medical Center in Richmond, Virginia, the CFO of Parkland Medical Center and the chief operating officer of Overland Park Regional Medical Center in Kansas City. CEO Carucci holds a BS in finance from Louisiana State University and an MBA from The Ohio State University. In addition to his role as Secretary Treasurer of the Portsmouth Regional Hospital Board of Directors, Dean serves on the New Hampshire Hospital Association Board and Executive Board and in 2018 was elected to the American Hospital Association Regional Policy Board. He is an avid runner, biker, and sports enthusiast. I suspect you share uh, the Chief's concerned about baseball. And uh, Dean and his wife, Kristen, have two boys, Griffin, four, and Nolan, two. So you have children at home. You're dealing with that as well. So welcome, uh, Dean. Thank you for being here with us. Yeah, thank you, Valerie. So yeah, I, I definitely uh, share the Chief's uh, dissatisfaction with our inability to uh, end up at sports events. Um, being a Bruin season ticket holder is painful to watch them uh, be in first place and in the season like this. So, um, you know, I, I, here's where I really wanted to start, um, you know, my piece of the conversation on, you know, one, uh, Mark at Hunt and I have been on the phone uh, a number of times through this event. Um, obviously, our constant communication with our EMS providers um, and, and quite frankly, even those competitors that, uh, you know, we, we compete with each day and every day. Uh, we've been on the phone every week uh, with a standing call. And so I, um, I've said this to the entire hospital and in a number of memos um, and stand up meetings, but I, I certainly have never been prouder uh, in my six years of being at Portsmouth Regional Hospital um, of our staff, our providers. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that's forgotten is um, even though they're providers, there's this disease has really created a level in, of anxiety and fear that we haven't seen in healthcare in quite some time. Um, and so their ability to rise to the occasion has really been phenomenal. And I think everybody on this call um, should be very proud of the hospital that you have here and all the providers in the, in the community, nurses, EVS workers, uh, physicians, APPs alike. So um, just very proud. And, and to that end, uh, proud of uh, this community and the way that it's responded to the event. Um, the chief talked about the fact that we're in a fairly stable environment in this community and in this hospital. Um, and I completely agree with that. Um, we definitely out of the gate uh, saw our fair share compared to the state's percentage over here in Portsmouth in terms of COVID positive tests, admissions of inpatients, um, but it is really leveled off and, and leveled off fairly quickly. And I think that credit goes to all of uh, the state of New Hampshire and the decisions that they made as well as local government. So um, I definitely wanted to note, note that. Um, that being said, uh, we've, we've certainly had our impacts. I mean, it's been 18-hour uh, days for the last six weeks straight, um, you know, in here at nights, making sure that our staff feel comfortable. Uh, and so, you know, we kind of broke this thing down into multiple phases. You know, number one was making sure education around the disease, its process, 
um, and how it impacts patients was known um, uh, throughout the hospital and our employed providers that work in the community at Appledore. The second was educating them on proper PPE utilization. You know, how do we protect ourselves so that we can protect uh, our patients and protect uh, transmission from patient to patient, um, you know, in all of our access points. Um, and that education was education, re-education, re-education, uh, as the CDC got to learn more about uh, the disease and how it spreads. Um, and so that was vital, really vital for us. Um, you know, I'd like you to know that uh, there are many hospitals across this country that have had to furlough or quarantine um, a number of staff. Uh, we have never hit a high uh, number that has been greater than four people on furlough and quarantine, and I think it really speaks to our education department um, and the way that we've gone about this event. And I hope that gives the community some real confidence that if you walked into this building, um, not only do we have a really deep bench uh, of critical care strength, uh, we've got the ability to keep you and your loved ones um, safe uh, from transmission of the disease. And so that, that's been a, a pride point of mine for sure, um, knowing that uh, there are systems out there that furloughed hundreds of people at the same time because of exposure. So I um, want to mention that. Um, you know, listen, um, I think we're probably at a pivot point now as an organization where we're starting to think about um, you know, how do we kind of hit the control delete button and, and try to get back uh, to some uh, sense of uh, normalcy and, and business as usual. And, you know, obviously, uh, every business that's on this call has taken a massive economic hit through this. Uh, hospitals are not alone in that. And so although there's uh, a very intensive type of patient that is in our building, um, uh, there are a lot of patients that normally would be here for surgeries and emergency room visits and outpatient imaging and uh, preventative care that are obviously not. And so the financial uh, devastation for hospitals and healthcare providers alike um, uh, is there. And, and so we're trying to think about how do we help get uh, folks through this. So um, that has been the pivot over the last seven days as COVID has become kind of part of our routine um, that we're going to live with for a while, uh, as uh, Dr. Punt said. Um, you know, I also want to mention I'm extremely proud that, uh, you know, you've seen the number of layoffs across the country. Uh, healthcare has not been immune to that. Uh, you can look around the state at the number of organizations that have had to uh, lay individuals off. Um, we made the decision that uh, we were not going to do that. Uh, and so we rolled out a program called Pandemic Pay. And so, you know, for departments like physical therapy that are only operating two days a week, uh, normally on a very packed five day a week schedule, um, those folks are at home, home right now, but they're getting paid 70% of their base pay uh, until we get through this, uh, you know, this pandemic. And um, you think about how do you revive economy? Well, making sure that people are continuing to stay employed, have a paycheck. Um, that's how it's going to happen. And so we've really taken that seriously. And our hope is that, you um, you know, is the phase plan that Dr. Fauci uh, and uh, our president rolled out yesterday. We can get back to business, get those people back to work and start to revive the community here on the seacoast. Um, you know, I do want to mention too for everybody on the phone, there's just so much information out there. We've tried to really streamline that for folks. Um, and so if you, if you do hit our website, portsmouthhospital.com, uh, we've got two things out there. One is um, a really consolidated amount of information around the disease and, and uh, a question and answer area, as well as a screening tool for yourself if you're wondering whether you may have COVID or not. Um, there is a screening tool that can help you at least make some decisions on, hey, you know, should I end up over at uh, Dr. Punt's uh, Convenient MD? Should I end up coming into the hospital? Uh, should I call Todd Germain and, and Portsmouth uh, EMS? So hopefully that will be helpful. And then lastly, um, Valerie, I guess I'd say this, you know, our, um, you know, we, we're a hospital healthcare system. And so we've obviously got a, a lot of outpatient access points and primary care offices uh, and specialty offices. And you know, we pivoted on a dime. We had not done one telehealth visit uh, in this uh, system's history, um, and we're now doing 300 to 400 a day, um, and we launched that in about a five-day period to make sure that people had access, particularly for those chronic disease patterns that need to be managed on an everyday basis. And so uh, that is out there for everyone in this community and, and our broader access points as well. Um, and obviously, traumas and strokes and heart attacks still continue to happen, uh, even in the midst of COVID, if you can believe it. Um, and so we're still, you know, making sure that we can take care of the community uh, in that way as well. 
Um, and so I just end by reiterating really my, in my first points, just um, couldn't be prouder of the, the folks that work here, uh, them overcoming and having the courage to overcome some of the anxieties and fears that this has presented. Um, and then the community, uh, the outpouring has been really unbelievable. Um, it really, it really, I hope, uh, highlights the fact of how important community is in general uh, and just human decency um, and that we're all in this together. So, you know, thanks for giving me a few minutes to just talk about our organization, our response. Thank you so much, Dean. I, I, I cannot tell you how pleased I am to hear about all of the good work that Portsmouth Regional Hospital, Community MD, and of course our fire department are, are um, the work that you are doing is obviously invaluable and we couldn't survive without it, but just, just your sense of community and the work that you're doing for the community is just, uh, I want to say thank you to all three of you for uh, all that you're doing to keep us safe. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Ben now so you can moderate some of the questions that we've had coming in and we'll wrap up at about um, 1.55 or so. Uh, so off to you, Ben. Sure, yeah, it does look like we um, lost um, Chief Jermaine, um, so hopefully, I'm not sure if he'll come back, because we did have a couple questions for him, but uh, I have a couple questions, and either of the medical facilities can kind of raise their hand. It, it, uh, they're, they're around where we're at in this process. Uh, people want to know if, you, if we're in the surge, if we're about to be in the surge, and the surge happened, you know, where are we at, and, and how long do we see this whole thing playing out? So. Uh, you're both unmuted. Whoever talks first gets to go. Uh, I'll start, Dean, and then you can you can uh, uh, qualify my opinion, so to speak. Um, so, so, so I, th I think in in the Seacoast region of New Hampshire, as Dean had actually said, um, we're we're near that peak, if not at that peak. And and um, if you look on daily new cases um, in in Rockingham County, the cases uh, daily. Um, they, the actual new case daily peaked about a week ago, but there's still, it, it still goes up and down. So we're, we're, we're about at that peak and, um, you know, it's hard to predict the future. There could still be, um, some, some more of the wave rolling through. Um, but I think at, at also as Dean noted with the sort of the number of inpatients leveling off, that also means therefore that, that, that if the severity of illness begins to level off, the number of new cases also are leveling off. So with those indicators, I think we're about at the peak, but I still think uh, you know, we have two to four weeks of coming down from the peak. So we don't wanna let our guard down because if we let our guard down, that's when we'll peak again, right? Uh, so all of the social distancing, all of the measures we're doing, um, from the community aspect are very important uh, to continue to do to ensure that we do not get a second peak of this. Uh, Dean, what is your thought? Yeah, I, I think you're spot on. I, I think we all, um, you know, listen, there's a ton of models out there, uh, Ben, in terms of that question. Uh, the Murray model, the AHA model, uh, the NYU model. Um, and I think by all accounts, when you look at those models up against our demographics and data, it, it appears that um, we've hit the peak in our, I think really in a flattened state almost. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll add a little uh, color around it. Um, on the inpatient side of the house for us, we've literally been in a steady state in the number of admissions that are COVID positive as well as those on a ventilator for about seven to 10 days at this point, which I think is a really positive sign uh, for this community. You know, I, I'd say this to everybody on the phone. I think the thing from a hospital perspective that we need to keep in mind is that our peers across the border in Massachusetts um, are not necessarily in as advantageous of a spot uh, as we are. And so, you know, as a hospital that takes, um, you know, 20 to 25% of our business is, is you know, transfers from outlying facilities um, just because of the depth of, you know, clinical care strength that uh, we've got. Um, that's what we're keeping our eye on. So not just about this local tight community, but as you think about beaches potentially reopening, as you think about tourism starting to pick up as it normally does in the summer, uh, businesses starting to reopen, the cross traffic between Massachusetts and New Hampshire, that's what we're really keeping our eye on. But I think for just our tight region, we've hit the peak and have leveled off. Dean, while you're here, I have another question that uh, I think is best fielded by you. Um, 
the question is around uh, PPE and, and ventilators and equipment. And, and do you feel as though as a region we have the supplies we need to do what needs to be done? Yeah, great, uh, great question. So, you know, um, and this is where uh, Dr. Punt and I started, uh, you know, five weeks ago, really talking about this and how we help one another out through this process, including testing. So, you know, I think there's three big things from a supply, you know, four th big things from a supply chain uh, standpoint through this event. Obviously, if, if you've picked up or turned on the news at all, it's all been about N95s, PPE, gowns, gloves, and masks, right? Right. Um, I think we are so lucky to have um, the scale that we do uh, for the company that backs us from a supply chain standpoint. Uh, we're in really good shape there. Um, I'm not worried about it, quite frankly. Um, the second big thing um, is uh, pharmaceutical. So you think about patients that uh, end up on a ventilator, uh, they obviously can't take meds orally. And so uh, they end up on drips. And so some of those drugs like propofol and fentanyl, and Versed, these really key drugs in managing, um, the supply chain is really tight out there for this stuff. Um, and so it's something that we're watching very closely. And the reason we've got to walk, watch it closely is not only for COVID and, and those that are critically ill, but it's, it's also to make sure that um, as we do reopen business and we have elective people needing these, uh, that we've got the ability to manage through it. And so that's the one area that's a little tight. And on ventilators, same thing. I mean, you know, we have our sister hospital in, uh, of Parkland and Derry. Um, we've got our sister hospital in Frisbee now up in Rochester. And then, like I said, even as competitors, we've all been on the phone together on the seacoast talking about how do you deploy and redeploy where the resources are, both clinically as well as from a ventilator standpoint. So I feel, I feel fine with the ventilator situation as well. Yeah, Mark, do you want to add in? Yes. Yeah, so um, fr from so obviously uh, um, Dean's health system has both inpatient and outpatient aspects to it, and Convenient MD is an outpatient uh, business. Um, so from from our standpoint of PPE, um, as Dean said early on, we were collaborating closely, especially um, to ensure our team found a way to get so we could fit test them for these N95 masks once we were able to source them. Um, over the last three weeks, three to four weeks, we've been able to, to actually source the N95 masks, surgical masks, gloves, uh, and face shields, um, and are, are well supplied on those. Um, we have had many uh, community resources like colleges, schools, uh, police departments, National Guard, uh, um, uh, and in other states, uh, universities actually provide some of these for free for us as well. Uh, where we're on the low side, uh, and this is not just us, I believe, but many uh, places is sourcing gowns. That's what the most difficult thing today is to source, um, but we're working on that and have supply chain to do that. The other aspect um, that we are very focused on is the ability to test, so testing supplies. Um, not only the swabs, but the actual media that you, you, you put the swab in to transfer to the lab for testing. And that has opened up recently because now we can use saline before it was this universal or viral transfer media that was short supplied. Um, but we actually are very well supplied now for testing. Um, the second piece of testing is having a lab that has a capacity to do the tests. And we have uh, partnered uh, with LabCorp um, to do that and are also uh, creating a relationship with Quest to do this. And, um, and we are now able to run uh, in around 1,200 tests a day, and that will be increasing shortly. We also do work uh, with the state lab who takes tests for first responders, police, fire, EMS, healthcare workers that are um, um, employed by municipalities, towns, cities, or the state. And uh, they will, uh, the state lab will run those samples, which give a much quicker turnaround time so we can get those people back to work, if negative, more quickly. Um, but testing supplies are another part of that supply chain that were very tight before, but have now opened up um, for us and for many. And Ben, let me just uh, add to that. Uh, you know, this is where the partnership matters, and, and um, I'm not even sure if Dr. Punt fully knows this or not, but um, we are, uh, the, he is absolutely right in terms of supply chain of testing was a real dilemma out of the gate. It's not perfect yet. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but it's gotten a lot better. Um, but here's where two, two organizations really partner together. All of our outpatient uh, sites have referred to Convenient MD for, for testing. 
um, for folks that want an outpatient test. And I, I think that just goes to show that in a crisis like this, this is you know where you come together. And so uh, we thank them for, for being able to offload the hospital uh, through the peak period, particularly uh, from having to take that on. And we thank you for that. And, and that uh, one of the positive things that comes out of this um, obviously negative pandemic is the fact that collaborations have occurred in a very great way for the benefit of the community that will last way beyond this pandemic. And, and so the, the, some silos uh, in, I'm sure in many uh, aspects of business, but especially in the medical community, that just had developed naturally have been broken down because of the uh, want and need of, of all of the healthcare uh, systems and, and providers in the community to work together to, for the benefit of our, of our citizens. Very good. And I have a question that I think is best uh, directed to Portsmouth Regional Hospital. It comes from this lady sitting right behind me who uh, places uh, UNH students um, that are in the occupational therapy program. And it also came from Great Bay Community College. They wanna know when uh, Portsmouth Regional Hospital will be open to taking students and volunteers and members of the community uh, back into the system. Yeah, it's a good question I don't have an answer to. Um, <laughs> I wish I did. So, <laughs> um, let, let me say this uh, first. You know. Uh, that is when I knew we were really in a tough situation, right, in terms of uh, what this was going to mean for the path forward. When I had to look at our volunteer director and say, hey, look, um, I have been challenging you for six years to build a, the, a top-notch volunteer program, uh, and, and I got to send everybody home. And, uh, and it's because, first of all, they, they donate their time. Uh, they are beyond valuable to our organization in the way they connect the dots for us, uh, the things that they see that we wouldn't see sometimes, just being here all the time. Um, and so, and that goes for our students as well. We pride ourselves on that. We're starting a graduate medical education program with, um, you know, Tufts Medical School this July. Um, and so, you know, I guess to directly get after the, the question, um, we're going to walk that in phases uh, just like we are the rest of our business. And so, you know, we're going to start to open up more elective type uh, book. Our plan is for May the 4th, barring some massive shifting in um, where the disease pattern is, is at in our local area and to make sure that we've got uh, the beds and capacity and the outpatient access to do it. And so I would see that communications will start really ramping up to those schools and our volunteers over the next two weeks. Um, and we will phase folks back in. You know, the one thing that we don't want to do is take someone that may be at risk. Uh, um, from a health stand phase plan. Great. Um, a couple other questions coming in here. Um, do you think uh, local business owners and employees will ever be tested, or will those tests still be reserved for first responders and people that are symptomatic? And I think that goes to you know talking about how we can start rolling out um, and, and opening doors again. Dr. Punt, you want to take that? Yep. Yep. So so I think so. I think the next step. Where, where we started, obviously, is help, is those who um, were, A, symptomatic and sick enough to need hospitalization or at least evaluation to determine if hospitalization was needed. Those that were high risk for, um, for complication, uh, like uh, being immunosuppressed, heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, as well as healthcare workers and first responders. We now have ex been able to expand that to start um, uh, looking at um, groups of people like full staffs, asymptomatic staffs of, of the skilled nursing facilities and the, uh, and the long-term care facilities. The, um, the next stage is going to be um, symptomatic uh, public that are not at high risk. And that is probably, honestly, um, it's something that the state has asked us today to consider and I have a call after, the, after this with the Chief Medical Officer of the DHHS to discuss that because 
it, we believe we now have the capacity to do some of that. Um, and um, so that's symptomatic for people in the community that before we were just recommending home quarantine because they weren't ill enough to need a treatment in a hospital um, but uh, and didn't meet the testing criterion. So we're taking the next step, I think, in the next few days. And then from there, uh, I think it, it, two things will determine um, testing. Uh, one is the continued availability to increase the volume per day, which I think will occur, but also the curve of the incidence of positive testing in the in the general community as we open this up. Um, as to uh, there may come a time where the incidence is low enough that testing isn't needed generally as well, and where those two lines of availability of testing and need for testing cross is what's I think still uncertain. Very good, and I think we have time for one more question, um, and we'll take that from Nancy Carmer at the City Economic Development Director. She'd like to know if uh, either the hospital or community MD has been able to access funds from the CARES Act, such as the funds dedicated to healthcare systems. Dr. Punch, you want so, to take that first since you're here? Sure, I'll start. So there, there were some funds um, that came from the CARES Act um, that were related to uh, the percent of uh, claims that one uh, sends to Medicare uh, for for Medicare services. And so we have been able to access that and we have gotten a, um, a, a check-in from the federal government for that. Um, we were not, our, our business is over 500 employees, so we, we were not able uh, to um, apply for the PPP uh, aspect of the small business aspect of the funds in the CARES Act because um, our business is larger than that. We're a medium-sized business uh, as per number of W-2 employees. Um, we, we do have the ability to access the one, uh, and this is uh, uh, businesses that any business uh, of any size can do, and that's defer things like Social Security tax. Um, it's more of a deferment of payment uh, till the end of the year, half of the end of the year, and half a year later, uh, but we, we are able to access that as well. Uh, um, we have um, been able, though, through uh, our own state, through Governor Sununu and some funds he put together for healthcare, to uh, access um, in a loan grant situation some funds through the state of New Hampshire, which has allowed us to support the citizens of New Hampshire, uh, seacoast, and throughout uh, the state uh, in ways that we would not have been able to uh, support previously. Um, and, and so the most significant funds has actually come from the state uh, for our business. Yeah, and the, the, the only thing, uh, Ben, that I'd add to that, so we fall in the same bucket, obviously, greater than 500 em employees here in uh, Portsmouth. Uh, Parkland doesn't fall in that bucket, neither does Frisbee. Um, and so what we were able to take advantage of, um, you know, different than what Dr. Punt talked about, uh, was there was specific relief for hospitals just based on the massive losses that we've all seen. Um, and so we're still waiting on the exact number, but that allocation has been given to the state of uh, New Hampshire to then funnel down to uh, each individual hospital. And so we're waiting on our, our final number of what that looks like. One other thing we have applied for and haven't heard of it, heard from yet, and, and Dean, you, you likely did this as well, there's a telemedicine bucket. Um, we, 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 like um, Portsmouth Regional Hospital, pivoted in five days and created a telehealth service, as we both spoke of. Um, the federal government has provided funds that if you've done that and you're continuing to serve, you can apply for some grant funding that way. So we have applied, but that, that application opened up just yesterday. That's right. That's that's great, and we're going to hope certainly that our our medical community is supported in that way financially. So, um, thank you so much. So, uh, conscious and sensitive of the of your time, and, and you are very busy people. And so, we're going to wrap up here. And I want to thank um, all three of you. Although I'm not sure that we have Chief Jermaine still on here, I'll thank him separately. But uh, Dr. Punt and uh, Dean Carucci, thank you so so much. I think you've shared an awful lot of information with us today a lot of it that we were all questioning. And so I think you've answered a lot of our questions. So thank you so much for being here today. And we certainly appreciate all that you are doing to, to keep us safe and get us well. So thank you for that. Um, 
I, I just want to remind people that all of our Chamber Chat Live events are recorded and will be posted to our Facebook and YouTube channels. Uh, if not today, then certainly the beginning of the week. And I also want to remind people that we need to hear from you uh, as the, the needs that you have right now. What are your concerns? What are your needs now? What are your needs going to be as you start working through recovery? And I know you can't tell us that now, but we need to know so that we can share with those folks that can actually do something about it. So. Um, please keep communicating with us. I was really happy to hear as the Chamber Collaborative that our medical facilities are collaborating and you've, you've uh, broken down some silos. It's something that we try to do all the time. So very glad to hear that part. Uh, I'd like to share that in light of the governor's announcement about schools closing for the rest of the year, next week we will have Portsmouth School Superintendent Steve Zadrovic, who I, I had signed up. I don't know if you're on. Uh, the chat today, Steve, the Assistant Superintendent George Shea, and Sean Clancy, who's the Associate Vice President at Great Bay Community College. They're going to talk with us about overall uh, what that means for their school communities, and I think uh, Assistant Superintendent Shea is going to help us out with some of the resources that would be available to students and parents who are trying to homeschool. I know, Dean, you're dealing that with that with a, with a four-year-old in particular. I have a four-year-old grandson, and I see what my, my son and his wife are going through. So uh, there's a lot of anxiety around that. And if there's no more school uh, through June, and then we have to worry about summer camps and whether or not there'll be any summer camps, there's a lot of anxiety around that. So we'll have these folks to speak with us uh, next week. Uh, I also want to uh, suggest to you that we all be kind and we all be helpful and we wash our hands and um, we take this time to reevaluate what's important in our lives because there's some things that can go away and there's other things that that will leave room for other good things to come in so i thank you all for attending today uh, we're in this for the long haul and we'll be with you through it as we navigate through. Now, I want you to stay on for a couple of moments. Our friend Dan Freund is uh, going to uh, give us some giggles from some backyard activities. We always want to walk away happy from these uh, live chats. So again, thank you to our panelists, our speakers. Thank you to all of you who participated. And I'll see you again next week. Thanks so much. Thank you. that I think it was helpful. I have to jump on too for just a minute.
<laughs> Thank you, Ben. Thank you all. Bye-bye.